Good morning to you all. Today is our midweek service. It's Wednesday. And we want to share with you the good news of the gospel of the, our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is not your will that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance and be saved. By grace, though faith in Christ, look down in pity on those that chose to scoff and mock at the glorious gospel of God. And we pray that in your mercy, grace, long-suffering, and great love, some might have their eyes open to the truth of your way and be brought into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will ask my brother Ben to come and read the word of God from 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 to 18. Good morning and happy Wednesday and uh, it's great to be here with you for your midweek mid service and to be able to read the word of God to you. As Johnson mentioned, uh, the, the word this week will be from 2 Peter 3 and it's a whole lot 1 to 18 and it's about the day of the Lord so dear friends this is now my second letter to you I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they have deliberately forgotten about forgotten that, the, that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world, world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, be patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements with melt in the heat, will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, blameless and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do in other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friend, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 
Wow, that's awesome. And um, yeah, once again, can't wait to hear what Johnson's got to share this week. We'll get him back. Thanks, Johnson. From the reading of 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 18, I have come up with a theme, expectant living. Expectant living. At this time of the year, many children have already written or are just sitting down to write their letters to Santa. It's exciting to try to fit all your wishes into one well-worded little letter. Maybe it would sound like something like this, these letters. Dear Santa, please give me a door this year. I would like you to eat, walk and do my homework and help me clean my room. Thank you, Jenny. Dear Santa, thanks for the race car last year. Can I have another one, only this time one that is faster than my best friend's car, race car, Rick. Dear Santa, I wish you leave a puzzle under the tree for me and a toy for my sister. Then she won't want to play with mine and I can have it myself. Merry Christmas, Kelsey. Dear Sandra, you can send me one of everything from the boys' section, but nothing from the girls' section. I can't wait for Christmas. Come, Kenty. Dear Sandra, could you come early this year? I've been really super good, but I don't know if I can last much longer. Please hurry. Love, Jordan. Doesn't that sound familiar? To children, Christmas seems to take forever. And it is so hard trying to be good while you wait for Santa to come. Like little Jordan, we are tempted to ask Santa to hurry up and get here earlier before we break under the strain of all that unnatural good behavior. Children can relate to today's Bible passage. The Christians in the early church are waiting for Jesus to return. They are excited. They are ready. But days pass, then months, then years. They are still waiting, and we are still waiting. People around them begin to mock their faith. False teachers infiltrate in the church and fill their minds with doubt. So where is this Jesus you are waiting for? When is he coming? Do you think he forgot about you? They go so far as to suggest that God no longer works in human history. Maybe God just set this world in motion and then went back to lunch and never came back. And sadly, many Christians start to believe them. Maybe Jesus isn't returning. Like little children at Christmas time who, go, who get tired of being good. Some of these early believers got back to their old ways of life. So Simon Peter, a follower of Jesus, write this letter to, pray, to reassure the believers in the early church. Verse 8 and 9. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He goes on to say, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything it will be laid bare. Verse 10. He goes on. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy life and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed is coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. And the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. 
the home of the righteousness. This is 11 to 13. What does he say on verse 14? So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with each other. At peace with him. So waiting for Christ's return became an important element in Christian life. The final chapter in God's love affair with humanity has not yet been written. Christ is coming again to take us unto himself. Simon Peter knew what that was like. The society of his day didn't want to believe him either. But the Bible tells us very clearly that someday Simon Peter will be proved right. And will all of us be ready for that day? I preached on readiness last week. Philip Brooks, the 19th century Saint Christian leader who composed the beautiful Christmas carol, all little town of Bethlehem, once wrote, the coming of the Lord has been the inspiration of the Christian world. So the power of life lies in its expectancy. We are expecting something. We are waiting for something. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord. So the power of any life lies in its expectancy. What are you expecting this Christmas season? Are you expecting crowds of people? Jumping schedules? Family tensions? Stress-filled shopping expeditions? Are you expecting a big Christmas bonus? Or are you expecting to meet Jesus? Which are you expecting? So the power of expecting starts with the seeing life through God's eternal perspective. If you and I are discouraged, downhearted, dispirited, it is because we are looking at the world through the human eyes and not the divine eyes. We need to look at the world through the divine eyes. Pastor Ron Mago counseled a young woman who was deeply disillusioned with her life. This woman had bought society's concept of who she should be. She had done all the things that her friends were doing. And she was miserable. She cried, I have lost my virginity. I have lost my sense of values. I am 21 years old. And I am just tired of life. I don't want to live like this anymore. I thought it was going to be so good. Here is a young woman. Who made the mistake of living with an earthly perspective, not a heavenly perspective. She bought the lie of the good life that is promoted so successfully in our movies and magazines and commercials. She thought that the purpose of life, her life was to grab all the gusto she could get. Because that is what we see on our adverts. And at just 21, she's already tired. Hurt, disillusioned. She's not alone. A lot of people are like that today. They are already disillusioned. They are already hurt. They are already tired. There are many people in this world, especially young adults, who have given up on achieving or fulfilling a life. That's why I find that there is a high rate of young people committing suicide. They've given up. They are tired of life because they are competing with the world standards, with what they see being advertised. They are afraid of relationship. They live as visual owners. They have done it all and have nothing left to show for their experience except a bad case of disillusionment. They are exactly the people that Peter is talking to in this letter. They started out as Christ followers. But the ways of the world look so attractive to them. Come on, everybody's doing it. That is what everyone is saying. That is what we hear. Why are you not doing it? Come on, everyone is doing it. Why worry? It feels good. Do it. Life is short. Play hard. That's what we tell each other. All the beautiful people do it. Looking at the world through human eyes you feel you are left out. Let me join. Before you know it, you are now tired, disillusioned, without hope. 
But how do we take on an internal perspective? How do we see the world as God sees the world? We do it first of all. By acknowledging that everything in this world will eventually perish except God. Nothing in this world is permanent. Our favorite car will rust out. Right now, maybe you are 30 years, maybe 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, 70 years. How many cars have you owned so far? That tells you that nothing lasts forever. Our nice houses will decay. Our best pair of jeans will fry and fade. Our money will be passed on to our heirs and the Australian tax office. And when Jesus returns to claim his kingdom, everything we strive for and the world dear will be destroyed. I am not a prophet of doom. But I am just telling as it is. And that is what the word of God is. And I know that some people don't want to hear such a message like this. It disturbs them. Everything, only the soul is eternal. As Peter says in this letter, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Journalist Bill and Judith Moyes did a documentary on death and dying. They discovered that many of the terminal patients they are interviewed found peace in the face of death. In fact, many of them found greater meaning and beauty in life after learning that they would die. One man lived four years past his doctor's prognosis. The doctor has prescribed that you would not last this month. But that man lived four years later. I know a lot of people. We have lived more years after the progresses from the doctors. In that time, he learned to cherish every moment of life. As he said, if you are told you will never see spring again, and you live to see spring, spring takes on a whole new life. It's a new thing. Nothing focuses our priorities quite like the knowledge of our own mortality. Advent is not a season for focusing on a morbid subject like death. But it is a season for looking beyond the present moment to the eternal and the evaluating of our life in the perspective of eternity. So the question for this second week in Advent is, what do you want to do with your life? For the Christian, there's only one answer. To live in a loving relation with God and with everyone else with whom we share this planet. That's what Advent and Christmas are about. Claiming the moment, taking time to nurture those relationships that matter most. Taking time. The Kish, the Maya Indians of Patamala, take the concept of purposeful living every seriously. The Kish tribe, a person who serves as a daykeeper. The Kish, they've got a person who serves as a daykeeper. The daykeeper's job is to show the other members of his tribe how to use each day well, making every moment count. I like that one. To the daykeepers, living each day well is an art form. And it requires concentration and guidance. So the day keepers remind the people to do every job, no matter how mundane, with a sense of purpose. So let's take this message from the Apostle Paul and use it our use it as our day keeper to remind us of how we should live holy and fruitful lives. The Christmas season, as most of us experience it seems almost designed to distract us from the God-centered living. Is that to distract us? We are concentrated on the material things. 
other than God. There's no so much pressure to shop, so much pressure, so much pressure to rush everywhere. We are rushing everywhere. Spend, 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 spend. Rush, 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 rush. Everything is happening. All of, and all of that, what then do we end up with? How many of us remember the Christmas presents we got last year? Where is it? Do you still treasure it? So the gifts of Christmas are temporary. The message of Christmas is eternal. The message that I'm preaching right now is eternal. All the gifts you have temporal. The Almighty God came to earth in the form of a man. Christ lived among us and shared our suffering and pain. He died a horrible death in order to save us from our sins. He opened up the way for eternal life for us. And someday he will come again to establish his perfect and eternal kingdom on earth. Until that day, our job is to share the love of Jesus Christ with everyone we know. That is the matter. To share the love of God, to share the message every day of our lives with whoever we meet. Don't hide who you are. You are a Christian. Let the people call you by that. Lois Pastor, the pioneer of immunology, lived a time when thousands of people died each year of rabies. Pastor had worked for years on a vaccine. Just as he was about to begin experimenting on himself, a nine-year-old boy, Joseph Mester, was beaten by a rabbit dog. The boy's mother begged Pastor to experiment on her son. Pastor injected Joseph for 10 days with this new rabies vaccine, and the boy lived. Decades later, of all the things Pastor could have ate on his headstone, he asked for three words. Joseph Master lived. Our greatest legacy will be the lives of those who know God's love because of our efforts. Those who point at you to say, I am a Christian because of so and so. I am a Christian because of brother so and so. I am a Christian because of sister so and so. Those who will be pointing at you that is our greatest legacy. That is great. Whose life will be transformed because you shared with them the love of Jesus. Claim this moment for God. Let that be the true present you give this Christmas. I just want to urge you. This Christmas, the most important gift you can give is to bring someone to know God. The present of life lived out in service to God and serve to others. Time is running out. Time is not on our side. We need to act and act quickly as we have been called. May the good Lord bless you as you continue to save him in his vineyard. Don't forget, you are the person God is calling you this Christmas to be a witness to someone so that they will know God through you this Christmas. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as the united voice of scoffers and clamors against God's way mock the truth it contains, we recognize that we are subjects of the predicted religious time when arrogant men, lovers of self, haters of God, weighed down with sin. Give us the wisdom to know what to do when confronted by the evils of this age. And we pray that we may stand fast in the evil days and be clothed with the arm of God so that we may stand firm in the faith, witness of the truth of your way, and warn others of impending judgment. Open the eyes of those that have been blinded to the truth. Bring men into the kingdom. We pray for your dear name's sake. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. May you continue to meditate upon his word and listen to his word and read his word. Then you grow. God bless you. Amen. <laughs>